Hey Amen. So we're here in Acts chapter 27. So what's happening at this point? So Paul, um, if you remember from previous chapters, um, he's had some trouble in Jerusalem. Um, people were trying to um, have him killed in Jerusalem. Um, the Romans kind of stepped in and kind of rescued Paul from the Jews um, out of Jerusalem. Now he's been in uh, so, sort of house arrest, I guess, um, under um, the governors of the Romans. Um, he talked to King Agrippa um, last week in Acts chapter um, 26. But now he, um, he got kind of away from, we talked last week, he got away from you know, going back to Jerusalem and, and being judged by this mob that was not following any biblical standards at all, is what we looked at last week. And instead, he appealed to Caesar. So Paul needs to go to Rome. So that's what's happening here in Acts chapter 27, is they are putting Paul on a ship, and he is taking this journey uh, to Rome. So Paul is in Caesarea um, at this point where he's being um, held, I guess, captive by the Romans. So Caesarea is a coastal city um, on the Mediterranean, on, I guess, what you would say the eastern um, uh, shore of the Mediterranean about, I don't know, just, uh, um, you know, a, a few dozen miles from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was kind of up the hill, as we saw, and Caesarea is the coastal city. So here they're taking Paul um, to Rome. Look at verse number one of Acts chapter 27, and let's see what we can um, read tonight. We're just going to get a few verses in, and I want to kind of uh, explain an interesting topic that we see here in, the, in uh, Acts chapter 27. Look at verse number one. It says, it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and, a certain, and certain other prisoners under one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustus band. So they give him to this um, soldier, and entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. So remember where Asia is here. So Asia is a place where Paul has been many times. Asia is kind of what we would look at as modern-day Turkey. Um, it's just up the coast, and if you would go, you could go, get there by land. Um, it's attached to, um, by land to where Paul is at now. So they're going to sail by Asia. So the idea is they're going to go north and then go um, to the west from there. They're going to go up the coast of what would be considered Syria at that time and then head west along Asia. Look at verse number 3. And the next day um, we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him literary, lit, liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So they're not even, Sidon is just, I don't know, I, I didn't measure it on a map, but Sidon is, uh, I thought about giving you a map for the, the journey, but I don't think it's really necessary. They've basically gone up the coast um, just a few miles, uh, 30 or 40 miles. In verse number four, so they stop there and they let, this is how, you know, friendly Paul is with his captors here. They're kind of letting him go and visit people, trusting that he'll come back and continue um, the trip to Rome. Paul wants to go um, to Rome. He wants to go and spread the gospel there. Look at verse number four. And we launched there from thence. We sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. So here we start to see um, part of the problem. Um, you know, they sail past um, Cyprus, which is the main island just below um, Asia. It's this large island, and it says that they sailed, they sailed on a certain side of it. Um, I believe they went to the south of it just by the, 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 um, the winds that we're going to see here, but under Cyprus, they, had to they basically had to sail on a certain side of it. It kind of gives you a, a picture of the trouble that they're about to have. They had to sail on a certain side of the island. It's not like they chose the shortest path. They had to sail a certain way because of the way the winds were blowing. All right, look at verse number five. And we sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia. We came to Myra, a city of Lycia. So now they are on the south of Asia. So they were able to go past Cyprus, and then they were able to get north at some point um, to get to the south of Asia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So now they change ships, and they get on this other ship that's, bound for Italy. And it, I don't know if it was a, a passenger, passenger ship or a merchant ship. The Bible says there was almost 300 people on the ship, so it was definitely carrying uh, people for a purpose here. But the Bible um, continues. So now they're on a different ship, and they're heading to Italy. Verse 7, it says, And we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Sinaitis, the wind not suffering us. 
we sailed under Crete over against Salmon. So this is another reason that I think that they went to the south side of, of Cyprus. Not that this really matters, but if you just look at maps and like to figure things like that out. They basically are getting driven around by the wind because sailboats back then, square sailed ships, cannot sail into the wind. They can get um, they can get close to the wind, they can get maybe perpendicular to the wind, but they cannot turn into the wind. Okay, so that's kind of defining what happens to them here. So they end up going to Crete, which is the island to the west of Cyprus. If you look at a map, they go to this island Crete and they end up going to the south because again, they have these north winds that keep pushing them down. The wind not suffering us, meaning the wind's not allowing us is what he's saying. The wind's not allowing us to go where we want to go. So they go over against Salmon, so more north winds. And hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. So now they're on the island of Crete and they go to this city Lycia and they stop at this city. In verse number nine it says, now much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. So we talked about this a little bit on on, uh, on Sunday night, but basically what Paul is telling them is, you know, Paul must have some sort of sailing experience here uh, because he gives, you know, some direction um, later on in the chapter as well, but Paul is basically saying sailing is now dangerous now because Paul knows what the circuits of the winds do, as we looked at on Sunday night, but basically the circuits that Paul is talking about are the same types of circuits that sailors even in California worry about, which is once you get close to wintertime, the weather always gets more severe. So on the coast especially, you know, people don't go out as much in the winter because it's severe weather, it's severe winds, that's when the storms come in. It's the same thing as like trying to cross the mountains, you know, the Donner Party, their biggest mistake was they tried to start their journey in like October, like at the beginning of wintertime, all right? So the, the weather is always more severe and it's more dangerous to sail um, towards um, the wintertime or approaching the fall in the wintertime. Now, it, it says that when sailing was now dangerous and then it gives it, um, in verse number 12, he literally says, because of the winter, all right? Look at verse number 10. And he said unto them, sirs, so basically Paul is warning them very specifically. He says, sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with her and much damage, not only of the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. So he's basically saying, you know, you're risking your cargo and you're risking the lives of everybody on the ship. So even from the decision to leave Asia, the owner of the ship mainly was taking some pretty severe risks knowing where the, the journey that they would have to go. Risks of what? Risks of the lading of the ship and of the people's lives that were on the ship, which is like 276 lives or whatever it was that was on the ship, sailing through winter. Look at verse number 11. It says, nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. So basically, the owner of this ship has decided to make this dangerous journey through winter uh, at, at the risk of the cargo and at the risk of the people that are on the ship. Look at verse number 12. And because the haven, the place they were, at, they were at, was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Fennis, which is basically on the same island. So here you have the owner of the ship who wants this journey to happen to Italy, and then you have um, these other people on the, ch on the ship. Basically, the majority was against Paul because they just wanted to continue on. There was a nicer city <laughs> over, over on the same island. And now this is really interesting right here. I find this interesting anyway in verse number 12 where it says, and there to win. So at least let's get to a nicer city. The, the vast majority wanted to continue on even though it was dangerous. So the owner of the ship wanted to go. He wanted to, I'm sure he wanted to deliver his cargo, make the money, whatever he wanted to do. You know, you can't, you know, if you're running a shipping company, you're not making any money, if you're not delivering things, you're not delivering the lading, all right? But the, the majority just wanted to get to a nicer place. So they were all with this guy to take this risk. But it's interesting because it says, which is a haven of Crete. So they wanted to go to this place in Crete, this next city over, 
which and lieth toward the southwest and the northwest. Now here's what's interesting. You're like, well, what is it? Is it the southwest or is it the northwest? But what's interesting, if you actually look at the island, this is how specific the Bible is. The Bible is literally saying, like, because if you look at the island and where they were at, to get to the, the city over here, they literally had to go to the southwest and then turn up and go to the northwest. So that's how specific the Bible is, which it was that northwest turn that we're having problems with in just a couple verses. Look at verse number 13. But that just shows you, that just shows you how detailed, you know, the Bible is here. It's literally saying like, hey, you know, we got to go down and then we got to turn back up and go up, which what were the winds that they were having problems with the whole time? They're having problems with this north wind, which is why they had to go underneath Crete and they ended up underneath Cyprus as well. By the way, most maps, I think, have this wrong, like on the internet. I think they, most maps just like, I think it's just easier to draw it going over Crete. But if you look at what's actually happening with the winds, they definitely went underneath Crete and they, they went underneath Cyprus and then they ended up underneath, they went up to Asia and then underneath um, Crete. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, and when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. So, so far, so good. They're sailing close to the island. They're, they're moving along. But not long after those arose it, arose against it a, temp, a temptuous wind called Eurocliton. So wh wh where do these temptuous winds come from? They come from the wintertime. This is what Paul, you know, was warning about. And again, it says, and the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind. So here this north wind comes back. This north wind comes back, and now they're in trouble. So what do they do? What do you, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> they let her drive. They just let the wind just push them wherever they're going. So it's like, see you later, Crete, and they're just going to where they're going. And if you just, I mean, the north wind's just driving them to basically to the southwest, and they lose, they lose the island is what happens here. All right. Now, I mean, we talked about this a little bit on Sunday night, but... This is just, this was the risk that sailors took, especially sailing square-sailed ships like this. You know, ships today can sail into the wind. Ships today can sail, they can't sail directly into the wind, but they can sail into the wind at 45 degree angles. Have you ever heard um, the term tacking? That's how, if, if I want to go to where Garrett is sitting in the back and the wind is blowing um, from that direction, right where he's at, I have to get to Garrett by going at a 45 degree angle tacking at another 45 degree angle and tacking back and forth until I reach my point. So I have to go, you know, twice the distance, really, just by going zigging, zigzagging back and forth. That's why sailboats, you know, if you've ever heard of tacking, you know, that's why they do that, because they're sailing into the wind. A sailboat can actually go faster. A sailboat today can actually move faster, get higher knots or higher speed on the water going into the wind than it can away from the wind, which is an interesting um, interesting little uh, physics thing there. But anyway, they took this massive risk and they lost, is, is what I'm trying to get you to understand. So that's really what I want to talk about um, in the sermon this evening. That's as far as I'm going to get in uh, Acts chapter 27. Turn to Proverbs chapter 13. I want to talk about this idea of taking risks in our lives. You know, when should we, these people here, they took what, you know, look, I'm going to judge as a stupid risk. They took a bad risk in Acts chapter 27 for, you know, for profit. Some took that risk, wanted to go to this next city for convenience. But really, you know, they took a really bad risk here and it did not, um, it did not pan out um, for the owner of the ship um, at all. So taking risk, what does the Bible say about taking risk? When should you not take risk and when should you take risk? Because I'm gonna tell you tonight, there's times in your life when you should take risk. And the Bible clearly points that out. The Bible doesn't use that word risk, but there is clearly times when you are supposed to take risk in your life. And I'll show you um, what that word is in just a few minutes. Look at Proverbs chapter 13 and look at verse number 11. The number one reason that people take risks that they shouldn't take in life is the same reason that the owner of this ship in Acts chapter 27 took the risk, and it's for money. So that is a reason that we should not take risk for money. I mean, it's the, I mean, the ultimate example, the ultimate example of, of taking risk for money that you should not do is gambling. 
is just, just risking something just for money. Look at verse number 11 of Proverbs chapter 13. The Bible says, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Now look, there's no verse in the Bible that says, do not gamble. But that's pretty much what this is saying. You know, there's no verse, I mean, I've even heard people say that, like, well, the Bible doesn't say you shouldn't gamble. You know, but taking risk only for money is basically what Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 11 is talking about. But the point is, Proverbs 13, 11 is, is, basically, is basically advising against gambling, all right? And it's, it's just saying, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. So basically, it's saying, you know, there's, there's ways to get wealth that's right, and there's ways to get wealth that's wrong, is what the Bible is saying. But in Proverbs, we'll go, go to Proverbs chapter 28, just a couple chapters over. Go to Proverbs chapter 28, and just a couple chapters over. But Proverbs 13 is saying that wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. And it's saying, like, it's just going to, you know, that's, uh, I guess, a, a easier way to sum that one up is easy come, easy go, is what people would say um, today. You know, and, you know, I remember, you know, my dad said that to me one time when I saw, like, somebody making a bunch of money. They were just making all this money by basically gambling. And I was just, like, I was a kid, and I was just like, man, that person's making a lot of money doing that thing that they're doing. You know, and that's when my dad's, my dad basically paraphrased Proverbs 13 and verse number 11, easy come, easy go. And exactly um, what he said ended up happening. Easy come, easy go. All right, because wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. So it's not going to stay with you. But he that gathereth by labor shall increase. I like the bumper sticker, the, the sticker you see on somebody's truck that says, you know, dirty hands, clean money. You know, that's another, you know, paraphrase of this proverb right here. He that gathereth by labor shall increase. All right, look at Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28, look at verse number 8. We're talking about when to take risk and when not to take risk tonight. Proverbs chapter 28, look at verse number 8. It says, he that by usury, and look at this, unjust gain increases his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. So there's two common themes in Proverbs 13 and Proverbs 28, 8. Basically, the theme that's common between these two verses is if you get your wealth by unjust gain, your wealth will not stay with you. So first of all, that, that's for the gambling, the lottery, all these different things. It, it's, it's a no-win for the, for the Christian. It's a no-win at all. In Proverbs 28, 8, it's saying, it's saying, hey, if you get your money by unjust gain or by usury, like by just, you know, like by, you know, interest basically is what that means. If you're just charging people interest, you know, which was an unjust thing to do to your brothers and sisters in the Bible, it says you'll be gathering it. Basically, it's saying you'll be gathering it for somebody else. It's like that wealth is going to go to somebody that actually is a good person and actually cares uh, about people. All right. So look, the Christian should never buy a lotto ticket. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it makes it makes no logical sense because not only is it greed and covetousness, you know, greed and it's it's basically wanting gain. It's wanting unjust gain without laboring for it. That's the first problem with it. The Bible literally says, though, even if you would win, you're not going to keep it. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible is teaching us. Here, I mean, you'll never come out on top. I don't believe that the Lord will ever let you win, but, I mean, you're literally more likely to be president of the United States, like literally, than, than to win the lottery. You're more, I mean, it's crazy, like the things, let me see if I remember the thing. Struck by lightning, president of the United States, win an Olympic gold medal. These are all things people have done statistics on, yet you see people line up and just spend hundreds of dollars every single month on lottery tickets, go to casinos, I've, I've heard people just spend tens of thousands of dollars of their money every single year at casinos. It makes no sense for the Christian. First of all, you shouldn't be greedy as a Christian. But unjust gain, the main thing for the Christian is this. Unjust gain is never going to work out for you. That's basically what the Bible is teaching here. All right. So it matters how you make your money. It matters how you make your money. Here's how, what you should do with honest gain. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. So look, getting unjust gain, taking all these risks, 
you know, just for money is wrong. But the Bible actually does give you advice on honest gain. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. So, Because, I mean, really, there's risk in anything. I mean, there's risk in everything that we do. There's risk in going to work. There's risk in, in you know, you get a paycheck and maybe you want to have savings somewhere and there's risk in what you do with that. There's risk in everything that we do. But the Bible is, first of all, saying, it's like, hey, you should not be hoping for unjust gain. You should not be taking risk hoping for unjust gain. That's the first thing. That is wrong, is what the Bible is saying. And as a Christian, you will never come out on top. And here's another thing, just another thing about gambling and, and like a lot of things that like I, I consider gambling, by the way, like day trading, futures trading, all these different things that people do where they're basically just rolling the dice on, on stuff, hoping to hit it big. Here's one thing that I've learned, like listen to, listening to people that do these things, because you never hear about people talk about how much money they lost at the casino. People never come back and they're like, oh, yeah, I lost $12,000 last Friday. They never do that. They're like, oh, I hit it big and I won $1,200 or whatever. You hear the guy at work talk about that when over the last 12 months he spent 80 grand. You know, I mean, the, the hotels, I mean, they're not, they don't look like that because they're losing money. You know, they're not the nicest hotels in the United States because they, they're not good at what they do. But people will never come out and tell you, oh, yeah, you know, um, I'm, a, I'm a day trader, and I, I lose everything. Except, but the reality is, is that 98, 99% of people that day trade lose all their money. That's the reality. So how can you never hear about the people that are trading futures and trading all this? Because, first of all, they're liars, most of them. They're only telling you about the couple wins that they've had and not the thousand losses. Right? So don't get drug in to that type of thing. We want honest gain. That's the main thing for the Christian. It matters how you make your money. It, matter, it matters how you got that 100 bucks in your checking account. God cares is what the Bible is saying. And to go out and just take all this risk and then, oh, I, got, I made 100 bucks. God's going to take it away from you anyway. It's a no win. Like It should be just a no brainer. I mean, the lottery is extra, extra stupid. But and, and the lottery is just a, it's a tax on people that can't afford it anyway. You know, so all the, it's just crazy. Like all these liberals that want to like, oh, we should tax the lottery and all this. You know what? You're taxing the poorest people. You go to a gas station and it's some guy that can't afford anything. And, and he's, he's up there just spending all his money on lottery tickets. It's crazy. It's a, it's, it's a tax on the, the people that literally can't afford it. And look, it's their own personal problem. I get it. All right, it's their own personal responsibility. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. The Bible talks about honest gain, though. The Bible talks about what you should do with honest gain. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse number 1. The Bible covers everything. It's just great. All right, before we get back into risk, let's talk about honest gain. What should I do with honest gain? The Bible says, cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. It's saying, hey, you got to get out there, and you know, you got to kind of, you got to be sowing. The Bible's saying you got to be out there, and you got to be going after it. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Now, this is kind of like giving a farming reference here. And what he's saying is give a portion to seven, also to eight. He's saying don't put your eggs all in one basket. He's saying, you know, if you're a farmer and you're out there farming, you shouldn't plant all just one crop. You know, you shouldn't plant all just one thing. He's like, you should be out there and you should kind of be, you know, and you could, you could apply this to, to your savings. You go out there and you work hard like the Bible says. You don't spend your money, all your money like the Bible says. You're going you're gonna to have a couple bucks and you've got to figure out what to do with a couple bucks. The Bible's saying, don't take it to the casino. It's saying, but don't put it all in one place either. It's just, it, the Bible's literally telling you to diversify in verse number two. The Bible says, if clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves. Why, why, why diversify? Why diversify? I think I got it all figured out. I think if I put all my savings in one spot, it says because you don't know what's going to happen, is what the Bible's saying. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If the tree falleth toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. It's like, you don't know what's going to happen. It's like, it could just, the, the wheat crops could be wrecked. My grandpa always said, he's like, I always had half cattle and half, half the land was in cattle and half the land was in farmland. And he always said, 
He said it always worked out so well because when the grain was up, the cattle were down, and when the cattle were up, the grain were down. He said it just worked out, and this is what the Bible's talking about here. The Bible's talking about not putting all your eggs in one basket. And verse 3 is saying you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how these things are going to work out. Look at verse 4. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. Now, this is a different piece of advice here. He says, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. But he's saying, he's like, look, don't put it all in one place. Don't put it all in one place. He's like, but you get out there and you just go after it and you work, is what the Bible is saying. And, you know, don't be the guy like in Proverbs where he's like, oh, there's a lion in the streets. The guy that like, oh, I can't, I'm afraid to plant here and I'm afraid to do this. And, you know, everybody's got an excuse for why they can't get something done. The Bible is saying, look, get out there and just sow. He's like, if you're sitting there and you're finding a reason not to go out and work and not to go out and labor like you're supposed to, he's like, you're not going to reap. If you don't sow, you're not going to reap. Look at verse 5. He's just saying, work hard, be smart. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb after her that is her child, even so thou, thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. He's just sitting there, he's just saying like, He's like, just be smart, get out there and work. And just like a good comparison is just like how you just get out there and you just work hard for honest gain every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. There's going to be good years. There's going to be bad years. But if you do what the Bible says consistently over time and you spread it out a little bit here and a little bit there, don't go to the casino, all these things, it's all honest gain. And you're smart and you're following biblical advice. It's like, it's going to work out for you. That's what the Bible is saying. You know, the Bible's giving some really good, solid advice here. Turn back to Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter 3. So, the first point is, risks that we should not take are just gambling to, just like what this ship owner did. Just gambling everything to make a few extra bucks to deliver some Amazon packages early in Rome. I mean, that's what this guy was doing. He was risking all the material, but more importantly, he was risking people's lives over, over this situation just to, you know, push his business faster. We should not be gambling, you know, for monetary gain. That's, that's what this guy was doing. Now let's talk about the risk you should take in your life. The risk that you should take in your life. So we shouldn't be risking for material things. We shouldn't be risking for material things. Because look, even if you do win, that's an unjust way to make money, and it's not going to work out for us. Look, if you have the desire, it all starts if you have the desire, if you have the love of money that much, as it says in 1 Timothy, if you have the love of money that much, you have a greed problem first. And that will drive you to take these risks to try to get unjust gain. You should have no desire to have someone give you $100 that you didn't work for. That should not be a desire that the Christian has. And then you won't have this problem of wanting to take risks over money. But here's the risk you should take. Look at Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5. Let's get some rules set up here first. Look at Proverbs 3 and verse number 5. Now we're talking about risks that we should take in our lives. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. So look, this is not just talking about salvation here. Okay, this is not talking about salvation. I mean, this could apply to salvation. How did you get saved? Because you trusted in the Lord. Because you trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ with all thine heart. But the Bible here is also applying this to just everything. This is a general statement saying, hey, trust in the Lord and not how you think things are going to go. It's saying just do what the Lord tells you to do and quit thinking that you have everything figured out. I used to be like this. I'll give you an example in just a few minutes. But see, people don't understand how God works. And from my perspective, this is a sad, sad thing for the Christian. And I think a lot of Christians are going to go their whole life on this earth, and they're not going to figure out how God works. That's a sad deal. But I believe that many people will do everything. Look, people will risk everything for a dollar. It's, I mean, especially a dishonest one. They'll risk everything for a buck, but serve the Lord? Nah. 
They lean on their own understanding for that. You're like, no, no, no. I, I can't go to you know, church because I've got to go make money. You know, I, I, can't, I can't serve the Lord. I can't, I can't move there. I know that's a good church. I can't move there, though. Because, insert a hundred excuses. Of what? Of people's own understanding. This is what people do. Look, it's sad. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Many people will live their whole lives. Many saved people will live their whole lives and not figure out how to get God to move in their lives. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand tonight. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse number 6. You're going to keep your place there, by the way. And when we move from Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to come back to Hebrews chapter 11 um, towards the end of the sermon. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and look at verse number 6. This is one of those verses that you probably heard a bunch of times, but maybe you didn't quite think about it like how you should have. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse number 6. It says, without faith it is impossible to please him. That's pretty important there. If you write in your Bible, I would underline the word impossible. Because that's a pretty important statement. The Bible is saying, without faith, you know what faith is? Faith is trusting the Lord and not your own understanding. Faith is, you know what? Faith to you might seem like a risk. To what? To your own understanding. So the Bible calls what we may think in our own understanding as a risk. The Bible uses the word faith for that. And the Bible says here, I mean, is this not an important statement? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Like, you literally can't please God if you don't have faith. But we're not talking about, you know, saving faith here. We're talking about the saved believer that lacks faith. You say, what, don't all saved believers have the same amount of faith? No. There's saved believers out there. If you're saved tonight, you have just enough faith to have trusted on Jesus and to be saved. Congratulations. That doesn't mean that you're trusting in the Lord with everything that's going on in your life. Those are things that the Bible is talking about in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. Without faith, it is, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is, here's another word I have underlined, a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I have three words underlined there. The number one, the first word is impossible. The second word is rewarder. And the third word is diligently. You know what the Bible here is saying? You want to please God? You want God to move in your life? You know, this, this is what people don't understand. You're like, I, I, I don't really see God moving in my life. And God, you know, I, I, I pray and, and it doesn't seem like God, you know, is moving in my life. You know what rewarder means? It means God will, is, God will move. That's what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about. God will move. If what? If you have faith. See, but people want God to move first. People want God to move first. They're like, God, I'll, I'll serve you if all the stars are lined up. If everything is perfect... I'll be, I'll be faithful, is what people want to do. But here's the problem with that. You know, it, here, here's my example I'll give you. I got saved years before I moved to California. Years. I think specifically three or four years. It's embarrassing for me to say that. You say, wh wh why, why, did it take, why did it take you so long? To, you, you knew... I was listening to Pastor Jimenez. I was listening to Pastor Anderson. I was just like binge watching sermons like all the time. My family, we were watching sermons together. We didn't have a good church that we went to. But you know what I did? You know what I did? I would keep my eye out for jobs in certain areas of churches that I, that I wanted to, you know, move to. And if there was like some awesome job that was like just this killer job, it was like, oh, man, I'd apply for that job. And then I'd be like, you know what? God, if you want me to move to that, that church, you know, and this awesome job comes through. God doesn't work that way. So what, is that, what does that mean for me? It means I wasted years of my life. That's what that means. God doesn't work that way. You say, why? Because here's how it really works. Here's, turn to Romans chapter 5. Here's how it really works. 
I'm like, you know what? You line everything up for me perfectly, and I'll go. And I'll, I'll get moving. Look, it wasn't that I didn't know what I should do. I was just like, hey, God, you know, just work this out for me, and I will go, and I will serve you, and I will... I will get my family in a good church, and, and I'll, I'll go soul winning, and I'll go get people saved. Like, you know, all the things that I should be doing if you just work everything out for me perfectly. I had the wrong idea. That's not how God works. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. Here's another verse that you've probably read, I don't know, a million times. The Bible says, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait for you to get your act together before Jesus Christ came and died for you. God wasn't sitting here going, hey, you know, I'm going to wait until they get 80% right, and then I'll send the Messiah to save them. No, it says, while we were yet sinners, we were a mess. So when you're sitting there saying, when I'm sitting back in North Dakota going, hey, God, if you move, I'll move. No, he already moved. That's what I missed. He is already moved. We play chess here. And one of the funnest ways to play chess is we have the little timer. And we sit there and you whack the timer and then the other guy's like, oh, you know, he's got he's to move. And then, you know, you whack the timer and the other guy, he's, his time's running down. Whoever's time runs out loses, right? Basically, the equip, Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, and God sending Jesus here while we were yet sinners was the equivalent of God smashing the button. He destroyed it. The clock is perpetually on you. That's how God works. So you're like, oh man, if God would just like, no, your turn. That's what the Bible is saying in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. That's why that statement that says, while we were yet sinners, is so important. Because God moved first, He's already moved. It's our turn. That's why in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse number 6, it says, diligently seek him. Meaning what? Your turn. All the time. Diligently means persistence over time. Your turn. God already smashed the button. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. It's perpetually our turn. So this, this attitude that I had, and look, once you move, you see them moving. Once you figure this out, you see them moving like it's unbelievable. Like once you figure this out. But you've got to figure this out as a Christian. Look at 1 Kings chapter 3. Here's a good example in the Bible of this. 1 Kings chapter 3, look at verse number 5. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 5, this is the story of a young Solomon just taking over uh, the kingdom, and the Bible says this, it says, In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. But God says to Solomon, Whatever you want. He's just like, Ask me what you want. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto my servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept him for this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Look at verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. So he's just telling them, he's like, He's like, I am nothing, and you've put me over this great people. He's really giving glory to God there, saying, these are the people that you've chosen, and these are a great people. Give, now, now here's the ask in verse number 9. He says, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? What does he ask for? He asks for something that is going to benefit the people, and especially benefit God. And by the way, he asked for judgment. Don't judge. He literally asked for judgment. He asked for an understanding heart to judge, because that's what judgment means, folks. It means to be able to tell between good and evil. Don't judge. Yeah, be an idiot. Don't understand what's right and wrong. What? Makes sense what we're seeing today. 
but he asks for something that is for the people and for God. It is the point. Solomon moved first. And then look what God does. Look at verse number 10. I mean, he didn't, he didn't worry about money. He didn't worry about money. He just had that faith. He took the risk. He didn't worry about his enemies. He didn't worry about, you know, God crushing people that were trying to kill him or trying to kill or destroy his kingdom. No, he just asked for something that would benefit the people and benefit the Lord. Look at verse number 10. And the speech, look at this. It, the speech pleased the Lord. You see that? What did it say in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6? It's impossible to what? It's impossible to please him without faith. So what did Solomon do? He demonstrated great faith to the Lord. He stepped out on faith. And it's interesting that the Bible uses the same word. It says, the speech pleased the Lord. That Solomon had asked this thing. Solomon moved. The Lord was pleased. Look at verse number 11. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing, it is not asked for thyself long life, neither asked for riches for thyself, nor asked for the life of thine enemies, but asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Look, God wants you to have judgment. But he's saying you didn't ask for all these greedy things yourself. You stepped out on faith there. He said, behold, I've done according to thy words. I'm pleased. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so there was none like thee before thee, neither after shall any arise like unto thee. He's like, I just gave you. He's like, I'm going to make you the wisest person that has ever lived on the earth, or that ever will live on the earth. He's like, I'm just going to make, and then he says, I'm going to give you the riches and all these things too in later verses. So the point is this. The point is this. What we look at as risk, in our own understanding, as Proverbs 3 said, is what God sees as faith. And God needs to see a step out on faith before we can please him. And if we don't step out on faith and we, and we tell God, like, hey, I'll do what you want me to do as long as here's my demands, we're not going to please God. It's a matter of fact, it's impossible to please him that way, is what the Bible is saying. I mean, people look at this stuff as risk, like, how, how will I make it? How will I make ends meet? If I, if I don't work these extra days, where will I work if I move? You know, where will I work if I, I move? I finally just, I finally just, we decided to leave. I didn't even have a job. It worked out. It worked out better than I could have even understood that it would work out. My own understanding could not have figured out how all the pieces God would have put together uh, to make that happen. He moved so fast, I literally had to step back. I was shocked. I was shocked. We literally, wait, 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 I was like, we're going to have to sell everything and, and, and get off the farm and equipment and animals. It was all gone in two and a half weeks. People would come buy one thing and they'd buy 20 things. It was crazy. And I was one of these people that was like, hey, you got to go out and you got to do it. You know, God's not going to come in and step in. And, you know, that's kind of how I was since I was younger. Boy, I was proved wrong. You move first, and you will have no idea what God will do for you. What you see as risk, God sees as faith. That's what you need to take away tonight. Or the lack thereof. <laughs> or the lack thereof. But people, you know, people, you know, people risk everything for a buck. This is the irony of this. Look, up to and including their own children. People will sacrifice their own children for a dollar, for a buck. You know, I don't know. How could I possibly stay home and, and have my wife stay home and raise my children? You know, we, oh, we just couldn't do without that money. It's like, you want to talk about a risk? I mean, the public school system, if there's ever a risk to the Christian child, that's it. But see, people will defend, they will risk everything to defend secular material things, work, cars, stuff, and then they would just immediately sacrifice the spiritual things. It's always the material things. It's always the material things. Look, I mean, work hard. Do what the Bible says, but look, you can't care about this stuff, folks. That, you know, work hard, I hope you all are successful. I hope you all, 
you know, do well in, in your careers and, and your jobs and all these things, but you can't care about this stuff. Let God, you know, what, you step out first and then let God work after that. And guess what? You know, turn back to Hebrews chapter 11. He will be pleased with that. You say, is this a, is this a prosperity gospel? You know, is this a prosperity gospel? No, I, I'm just telling you, he'll be pleased. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't, I don't know what he's going to do. He's going to be pleased, though. He's going to be pleased. This is the whole point of Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse number 39 of Hebrews chapter 11. It's talking about these prophets. It goes through the list of the, these prophets that did these great things and and many of them were killed, and many of them had, you know, they did not have good lives, and, and they didn't, the whole theme of Proverbs, or not he, Hebrews chapter 11, is that these people, they, you know, Isaiah and, and Samson and, and all these people in Hebrews chapter 11, they lived these lives, and they didn't gain anything from it. You know, Abraham, he didn't see the promised land. You know, he, he did what God told him to do. He did it by faith. He did it by faith that God, you know, would do it. But he himself didn't see it. And many of the prophets, not only did they not see, you know, the promises that God was making, but they actually paid dearly in their lives. They paid dearly by, by being persecuted their whole lives. Think of Jeremiah. Just people just, just despised him, never listened to him. Eventually, many of these men were killed and tortured and all these terrible things. But look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 39, and the Bible explains why they did it and the importance of it. It says, and these all, all these prophets, having obtained a good report through faith. So it's saying they had the faith. They stepped out with no reward. They moved, and it says they received not the promise. They didn't see the reward. And then look at verse 40. It says, God, having provided some better thing for us. Like, what? How do we come into this? It's saying, God, having provided some better thing for us, that they, see? See how we tie to them? It says that they, without us, should not be made perfect. Do you understand what those two verses are saying? Those two verses are saying that those men and women that had that faith that didn't receive the promises, you say, why did they? They did it for us. It's saying, through us, doing what? Being faithful, they, their work was made perfect, is what it's saying. Now apply that to yourselves. See, you stepping out on faith, you're like, where's my reward? Where's, where's my you know, benefit? Maybe you don't see a reward. But you do it for them. You do it for the next generation that sees you do it. The reward in itself is knowing that your children will follow your example. That's the, that's the reward in itself. And look, I God help, help us all that our children do follow our example of stepping out on faith. That is the reward in itself, and then that makes our faith and what we did step out on, it makes it perfect. It completes it. That's what it means by perfect. It means it makes it complete. That's why we did it. That's why they did it. They didn't see any reward. They did it for us, and we complete what they did. It's the same thing looking forward to our generations. But guess what? It works both ways. It works both ways. Our shortfalls, the risks that we won't take, the things where I have my own understanding and I just refuse to step out on that faith. I'm like, you know what? I don't know. I, I like, you know, I like most of the, the Bible, but these standards here, I don't like that part. That part also will be carried by the next generation. And I don't know how many times you have to see this in your life. I've seen it so many times, but you know, especially with sins, the sins of the son are way worse than the sins of the father. It like, it, it like echoes into the next generation. So look, it works both ways. But the Bible is saying here that we need to step out first. It's a, that's the risk that we should take. Our spiritual life. Just step out on that faith 
And then that will carry to the next generation, and that completes why we did it. But you want to see God move in your life, it's your turn. That's the point I'm trying to make tonight. If you take nothing else from the sermon tonight, you know, but no, we want a down payment, right? We want a down payment. We want a down payment from God. Like, hey, you do this, God. No, the house is already built. It's all paid for already. There's no down payment needed. It's our turn. If you take nothing else away tonight, take that. You move first. You see it in the Bible. You just, just do it. Just do what the Bible says. And you know what? You'll see God move. It's a real thing. I mean, God's not messing around here. It's just the point is, you know, we, we, we feel like I sit there and I'm like, well, you know, God doesn't move in my life. God doesn't move in my life. It's because it's not, it's not his turn. The button's broken on his side. He smashed it into the floor. Your clock is perpetually running. You want to see God move in your life? It's our move. Let's bow our heads and pray.